Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Roto World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined by Danny Carter, where we're going to break down a little bit more of the wild card round, fall out, look ahead a little bit to the divisional round, take a peek at the coaching carousel that continues to spin with no official head coaching hires yet and more just like trade offers being bandied about. Uh, each one of which seems like an increasingly terrible idea. Um, <laughs> four first round picks for Sean Payton. But Denny, everyone knows there actually is a far more important topic that we have to lead off the show with. And, uh, you know, speaking of the coaching carousel, Cliff Kingsbury was let off the coaching carousel. He hopped, off, he hopped off on himself. He hopped off and he did what everyone has dreamed of since the beginning of time. Uh, he bought a one way ticket to somewhere and did not book a return date. He's in Thailand. Denny right. Carter. It's and uh what do we make of this movie? Like like the song goes, and this is immediately what I thought of two two tickets to paradise. And this <laughs> is he he followed Eddie Money's advice and he got out of town. Uh yeah, I think I think that this is warranted. I think um it's uh, definitely warranted. If there was anyone that'd be like, Yeah, he probably needs to go to Thailand for like six months. It'd be yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> having a deal with the drama in Arizona and having to deal with Kyler Murray hating your guts for years, not, ju not just this year. It's been years it of been him years. just despising Cliff Kingsbury. Seething, having... just seeds at his very presence. You know, and... it's like a military dad with like a 15 year old child that like keeps getting up at one 30 PM every day. Kyler Murray just <laughs> seethes yeah. at Cliff Kingsbury's presence. I, I mean, I mean, intentionally humiliating him on the field and whether this is warranted or not, I'm, this is not, the, not for me to say. I don't. I don't know the ins and outs of, of what exactly was going on. Maybe we will one day. But after that, yes, you 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 can and probably should just get get out of Dodge, as the kids are saying, and uh, go go to Thailand for a while. And honestly, I, I I wanted to just cite this tweet real quick because I I thought of it my myself when I heard about Kingsbury taking this drastic move. Also, Kingsbury was apparently completely gobsmacked by the fact that he was fired. He didn't see it coming. Okay. He's the only one, but he, but well, it's like, probably cause he, he kind of was like, yeah, sure. It's been bad, but they've guaranteed my salary for five years. Yeah. That's actually, it's a good point. But yeah, this uh, uh, person I follow Victoria at FFB underscore Victoria uh, said, uh, you know, a one way ticket to Thailand for the love of God, would, would one of you guys just try therapy and yes, <laughs> men, men would rather, Get on a one-way yeah. trip to Thailand, then go to therapy for five minutes. Cliff, that includes you. I mean, in his own way, this is, of course, therapy. And this kind of segues into my next question is, what do we think he's going to find there? Like, what, what is Cliff Kingsbury searching for? What might he find in Thailand? I mean, he's there. Apparently, his 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 girlfriend, is this right, has, been, has posted pictures from, from Cambodia and Thailand. Cambodia. So it seems like, really, they're just kind of like millennial styling, really. I like any hope that he might be going to find deeper meaning, you know, no offense to Cliff Kingsbury, but on like the mid season hard knocks, there was a rather infamous uh, moment where they were touring his house, you know, his like palatial modernist mansion yes. in suburban Arizona. And there was a giant painting of a lion on the wall. And they're basically like, well, what does this signify? And he's like, Oh, he says, I'm a Leo. That's what it signifies. Like, they're, like there was just no deeper meaning to it whatsoever, and they all kind of stood there awkwardly, and then everyone was like, "Yeah, you know, maybe this guy should try to find some meaning in his life beyond football." In in the uh, uh, the tour of his mansion, uh, how many Scarface posters were there? <laughs> there were zero. I mean, this was 15 years ago, of course. Every room, like, well, this one is an original print uh, Scarface. You know, you can see the original. Lettering and font. Uh, that's one from, from 1980, official Universal poster. Yep. And then you know, then he's got what like here. This is a bootleg one I bought off eBay that has Ice Cube photoshopped into it for some reason. <laughs> and this, uh, is, this yeah. is this is the gun from the final scene. Yeah, but this was 2022, not 2007. Yeah. The other thing too, I think maybe he's going because Cliff Kingsbury. I don't. Know, maybe he's like feeling. Yeah, he might be at a he's probably feeling at a low ebb right now. And like maybe his self-esteem's a little low. And I think maybe he thought there was no way, like that if the Patriots tried to hire him, there's no way he like couldn't do it. Like he would just brow be browbeaten into it. Yes. And he doesn't want to work with Mac Jones for the next three years. Because he's already been screamed at enough. This is a Kyle good Murray. this is a great point. His next natural step, I think I said it two weeks ago. I said just just put him on the Patriots staff. He's already there. 
And he, but, he knows but, Bill Belichick wouldn't know how to locate anyone in Thailand, too. Right. But but when you when you think about what that means, it means having to work with Mac Jones for the 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 final two of uh, two failed years of his rookie deal. Like if that's already it's already sealed up. Like Mac Jones is bad. He's not. He's a. He's a. Uh, he's not a starter. He's not going to be a starter after the Patriots are done with him. Maybe. Maybe he won't even be next year at some point. And Cliff Kings, Kingsbury has to sign up for that. No. Yeah, you don't leave the Patriots or you don't leave the Cardinals to get yelled at by someone even worse than Kyler Murray. You just don't do way that. worse. Um, way way worse. And two, I mean, he's now being paid to do nothing for the next five years and working for Bill Belichick. Uh, pretty much is the exact opposite yes. of doing nothing. They would have the man working 20 hours Look, a day. He's um, uh, Cliff Kingsbury is being paid to do nothing. He's in Thailand with his girlfriend. <laughs> he has an eight pack. I mean, you know, what, what, what else, what else could you ask for this guy? This guy's living the life. He just needs to now the, the zoomers won't know. He just needs now to avoid any scenarios from the 2000 20th century Fox picture, the beach starring Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> uh, real millennials, Gen Xers will remember. On vacation in Thailand, Richard sets out for an island rumored to be a solitary beach paradise. Denny, it's anything but. Um, I, I've heard. I did not see the movie, but I figured that it was not just a nice uh, no. beach. There, and Adam, producer Adam says it's a incredible movie directed by Danny Boyle. It is quite good. Starring, yeah, I, I should uh, see it. I should ironically, a Leo. Uh, Leonardo. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't think that's ironically, but whatever. Lion. Um, we're gonna move on to. We gotta be on Thailand. We gotta leave Asia. We gotta return to North America. Danny, we've got six wild card games in the books now. You and I last week spent the Tuesday show kind of going through our playoff power rankings. Nothing really happened to like upset that apple cart, or the you know, weekend unfolded more or less how we expected. The coin flip games were. The Chargers and Jaguars, and it turned into a one-possession coin flip type of game against all odds after being a four-score game in the second quarter. Vikings-Giants was a coin flip game that kind of came down to the wire. And then Bucks cowboys was the game no one really knew what to make of, but the higher seed – oh, they're not the higher seed. They should have been the higher seed. The better team with the four more wins emerged victorious in the Cowboys. Just wondering if anything happened over the weekend to kind of change – your state of mind about the postseason field was mm-hmm. someone like extra impressive Was someone more disappointing than yeah. you were expecting Did anything happen to change your views on the tournament field. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, as you know, uh, I guaranteed I sat by the pool side, as you said, and I guaranteed the giants would upset the Vikings. You did. <laughs> uh, and I, and of course that came to pass. I was never in doubt. You were, by the way, uh, I mean, you were extraordinarily right about that. You basically <laughs> said it was just open and shut. Yes, and then so uh, the Vikings stopped the Daniel Jones led offense precisely zero the, times. The second I saw the the the, the, mat, the the playoff matchups came out, and the second I saw that game, I said, "It's oh, that's over." There's there's not even a reason to watch that. <laughs> you game. You really did because because <laughs> a it's not on NBC and b. The Vikings can't, they cannot beat the Giants. They could play 25 times the Giants who win every time. Um, it, look, the Giants are dangerous. The Giants are dangerous. And it makes me yeah. rethink my my conviction on the Eagles because now they 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 play the Eagles. Now, I'm not saying the Eagles are going to lay down or anything or, or they, they can't compete. Of course, they, sh- they should be favored. They probably should win comfortably against New York this weekend. But our former colleague, John Daigle, now with four for four, he, he had this. Uh, the stat that sort of summarized why I think the Giants are so dangerous at this point. Uh, Daniel Jones averaged four design rush attempts per game during the regular season. He only had two design rushing attempts when he played Philadelphia last time. During uh, In that Vikings game, Daniel Jones had 11 design run attempts uh, for seven first downs. I, the, the, this uh, willingness to make Daniel Jones, who is who is a, an efficient, good rushing quarterback, to, to, to use him as a, a rushing weapon adds something to this Giants offense and compensates for Daniel Jones's uh, unwillingness to be aggressive downfield uh, in a way that I think that makes the, the Giants offense way more dangerous than I would have thought coming into this uh, playoffs. Into He's also playoffs. someone at the end of his rookie contract. So Brian Dable may be getting into if, if he li- if he dies, he dies mode uh, <laughs> with Daniel Jones. <laughs> to quote another movie, the Zoomers have never seen Rocky 8 or whatever. I've never seen it. Either. Four. What? Um, yeah. I've only, the only Rocky I've seen is the original Rocky. 
Oh, my um, God. Wait, wait, I, I think I knew this, and it's so upsetting. I'm really upset right now. We've I mean, seen all the gifts. That's the same thing, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like I've seen so them. disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, think it's not, work, it's not a work of art. Let me say, Rocky Four is very um, in-your-face uh, not exactly subtle, but it's it's important Cold War. Uh, so here's a little jingoistic. I mean, not that uh, you know, I can get behind that. Well, I guess. What's your, what's your problem with that? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, no problem with that at all whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I do. I think the Giants game was still more about the opponent than the Giants. It was the second time all year the Giants scored more than thirty points. Like, I, I just I don't see that feat being replicated against an Eagles team whose defense got a lot healthier down the stretch, who hopefully their quarterback got a lot healthier. I mean, the Vikings are just pathetic. I mean, they just cannot stop a single – I mean, they went down 33 to nothing to the Colts. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible defense. It makes zero sense that the team somehow won 13 games. I mean, you have to be – to make your own luck like the Vikings did this year, you have to have some base level of competency. You can't just like say it's like a total nothing victory – but to me, it has absolutely no bearing on this matchup with the Eagles. And Daniel Jones rushing more, that will be a key. And I'm assuming that will stick. A, because, yeah, it's the playoffs. B, because, yeah, he is unsigned for 2023. Not that they're going to try to get him hurt because um, they want to no. continue this playoff run. But, I mean, these teams did just play December 11th because uh, they played week 18 where the, the Eagles were just trying to get Jalen Hurts healthy and the Giants started Davis Webb and it was a really weirdly close game. But when both teams were at full strength in week 14, the Eagles went 48 to 22. Uh, so yeah. this is like one month ago that they just absolutely annihilated the Giants. I, I do, I, I don't, I don't think this game will be close. I think the no. Eagles will, will cover. Yeah. I look as some as someone who said, "Oh, it's the Eagles are bust." Uh, I'm nervous. That's that's all I'm saying. I I, I want to just really quick say. I'm only, real quick. You can. I'm just only nervous. The only thing that makes me nervous about the game is Jalen Hurts' health. The Giants don't make me nervous. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, so I, I do think Brian Dable is like going all out to to win. And I know that sounds funny, but like he is he is not trying to do anything but move the ball in the most efficient way possible and score the most points against the Vikings. Against revolutionary the Vikings. concept. Listen, and it, 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 you know it is uh, the against the Vikings last week, the giants were 16% over their expected pass rate. That's a season high by a long shot on first and 10, which is a a critically important uh, time to, to be pass heavy 16% over their expected pass rate. You go down second and long 40% over their expected pass rate. They were not giving in to this idea that they're going to bleed the clock. They're going to run a balanced offense. They're going to make the Vikings respect the run. No, no, no. They, I think they're all in on an approach to win no matter what. And if that means opening up the passing game and letting Daniel Jones do his thing, it looks like they're willing to do that. Yeah, I, I agree that he's like game plan specific at this point. He will do what it takes to win the game at hand. And against the Eagles, that actually will take running the ball and like milking the clock. Eagles were totally elite against the pass. They yeah. will devour Daniel Jones if he has to throw 35 times. I think uh, the Eagles quite vulnerable on the ground though. They did get healthier down the stretch. It will be interesting to see how the Eagles run defense looks. I mean, the Eagles are very vulnerable on the ground. Yeah. I, I think Brian Dable is going to be, be keeping Daniel Jones's attempts under 30 in the divisional round. They, he will get devoured if he has to throw 35 times against the Eagles. Yeah. You're probably, you're probably right. I, it, I, I will say it could be a situation like we see with the Eagles and the bills to an extent where they are going to relentlessly attack the weak part of a defense and against the Vikings, that's definitely the pass game. Not, not that they have a stout running a defense. Okay. They, they don't uh, it's like in middle of the road in most uh, you know, by most metrics, but against the pass that they, they've been eaten alive this year. I think obviously that's what the giants were doing there. So maybe you're right. Maybe they will be a little more conservative here. Thank you for blowing up my argument. So, no, no, but your argument is still correct. You're just saying that, Brian Dable isn't – he's not subscribing to, like, any preconceived notions about what it takes to win in the playoffs. Like, he if, – if it, if it requires passing 40 times, he will do that. That's Where right. a lot of coaches just will not do that. That's right. So you're absolutely correct. I just think it's going to require something different against the Eagles. I don't, the Eagles, though, they're just, it's weird how they were the best team all year, but now they're a black box. You suffer, like, one injury, and, like, your entire team just kind of becomes sort of a black yeah. box. That's how important yeah. the quarterback position is. So really, really hope – Jalen Hurts is out. Matt, by the way, the Vikings, man, 
we already talked about this on the recap show with Pat and Kyle, but I mean, Kirk Cousins, I mean, it'd be nice if one guy ever defied expectations. <laughs> was like, I mean, not that that yeah, game was his man. fault. Uh, it was the defense's fault, but man. Um, uh, look, it, uh, Kirk Cousins is there to check down to his uh, short area targets, and uh, that's what he's paid to do, and that's what he did. And, you know, even though it wasn't Kirk Cousins' fault, it was Kirk Cousins' fault. Let's, let's not get a twist. It, you know, it is. Look, Kirk Cousins has zero dog in him. Nothing. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a kitten in Kirk Cousins. He has no dog, no desire. It's no, unbelievable. No dog. Yeah, to get out dogged. But Daniel Jones actually has a lot of dog in him. I was going to act like dog oh. and Daniel Jones was a new thing. He actually always had no, that dog. He has... He has maybe too much. He puts yeah, his he body does. on the line a little too much for my liking. Way too much dog in Daniel Jones. Uh, speaking of someone who's just had way too much dog for way, 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 way too long. Some are saying 10 to 12 years too long. Tom Brady, Denny. Uh, Tom Brady was not good this season. He was absolutely horrific in the Jaguars' wild card loss to the Cowboys. Just, mm-hmm. A man who just seems like he's decided as he's approaching 50 that he will never take another hit again as long yeah. as he lives yeah uh, i don't know if i've ever seen a quarterback even aaron Rodgers, and his i'm not taking a hit prime took more hits than this and so brady was not good this year but how bad was he really were there any glimmers in the advanced stats and while he was not good this year it still wasn't like peyton manning's final year yeah. or like ben rother roethlisberger's final year where you could still watch him play and be like oh yeah maybe this guy will be better next year like a different situation etc this, how bad do we think Tom Brady really was this year? And what do we see in the numbers heading into 2023, where he will almost certainly be playing for a different team? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I think you can pencil him in on a different team. Uh, I, there's no reason to come back to this, honestly, very poorly coached Bucks team. Um, uh, the personnel was the same this year, and uh, they did far worse. And they, I mean, they barely made the playoffs in probably the worst division in the history of the league. So let's just be upfront about that. Look, Tom Brady's numbers were were in mostly not pretty. Uh, his three point five percent touchdown rate was the lowest rate of his career. I was gonna say, was that a career low? Which wow. is just crazy that that's the case. Uh, I remember he set the uh, record for attempts and completions this year. You know how much dog Tom Brady? He 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 stat chases totally meaningless records in week eighteen when they already have the division stone. He wanted the single season completions record. Yeah. Yep. Like yep. The two you gotta dial back the dog levels. He's he uh he he loves to he loves to be the best and we yes. can't uh we have to hand that to him. Um his six point four yards per pass attempt were his fewest lowest mark in a season since Pat since two thousand two when Kyle Dvorak was not born. Say what? I think he maybe he was alive. He was one year old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, I was a freshman in college. Um, Ooh, that's so that's great. that's down bad. I'm sorry. Oh God, don't it? I just I'm sorry. I'm that was down, that's really down bad. Uh, I, I do I do think that the uh, the Bucks, you know, top down approach to offense was quite bad this year. It, they they really got away. Um, from what they were doing under Bruce Arians in 2020 and 2021. Uh, first of all, they got way more conservative on fourth downs uh, that they that they should have gone for. We saw that last night. Yes, you know? there was a few inexcusable uh, ones on Monday evening. I, I, I mean, we're, we're talking, Todd Bowles is taking a Rex Ryan circa 2003 approach to, to uh, decision-making on, on the field. Also, their um, play action rate dropped. From uh, about twenty percent in twenty twenty and then twenty twenty one to sixteen percent this year, uh, it's not a huge drop, but it, it, it's enough. Especially the fact, and this is from our, our buddy Rich Rebar at Sharp Football Analysis. Uh, Rich said that using play action, Brady averaged nearly two more yards per pass attempt, uh, p- pass attempt than without. So he was good in play action. And they never used it. I mean, sixteen percent is the almost at the very bottom of the league. So re, I think that this is an offensive uh, systemic problem more than a Brady problem. I think that he'll be fine if he goes somewhere, Vegas or wherever this year. I do think it was both, but I just can't decide which one was a bigger factor. And so you know, you watch the Bucks, and it's like, so you can't play hurry up offense the entire game; it will lose its effectiveness. But like the Bucks not going to tempo earlier Monday night. So many yeah. games where they needed to go to tempo earlier. I mean, Tom Brady, 
of all the things he's the very best at, like no one in the history of football has ever been better, at, like tempo offense, like two minute type offense. Right. And they went to it against the, I mean, the Cowboys were laying back, of course, but he's just playing pitch and catch the entire fourth quarter. Cause that really is what he does best. Now you can't do that for probably 60 minutes a game, but just the total lack of adjustments, the refusal to just do what they're best at right. was so concerning from the offensive approach perspective. The only thing where with Brady, where I am wondering if he's like actually done is that by most advanced metrics, the Bucks offensive line was not even bad. Like pro football focus graded them as the fourth best pass blocking offensive line. But if you watch these games and like watch Tom Brady's body language, you know, he acts like he's playing behind an yeah. offensive line full of five rookies. That's right. And he's grown to so allergic to getting hit that I do wonder if he can, I, I almost wonder if he's like with, hit, without even realizing it, if he's finally mentally checked out on the NFL. Cause the guy's been taking mammoth hits for 23 years where like right. no one would begrudge him to not want to do that anymore. It seems like maybe he's gotten too allergic to hits finally. It's actually, yeah, and I'm glad you raised that point. I wanted to mention this earlier that um, watching Brady this season was almost disorienting because you you don't see that sort of movement from an NFL quarterback. Yeah. Um, the, the, those those sort of movements to not get hit, uh, it actually turtling, you know, like 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 actually just getting down, yeah. not taking not taking the hit refusing to stand in and look i i'm not blaming him look the guy's 45. he's 45 he, okay. he's he get his get his entire rib cage broken he doesn't he, he doesn't, doesn't need that doesn't want that um last night uh after after a turnover i believe it was he tried he tried to slide tackle someone yeah that uh, was bad that was the mac jones in him that he that's but, always but I mean, been but in I mean, him. What, what i'm saying is he he was not going to lay it on the line he was not going to actually go tackle someone he was going to get down on the ground and try to kick someone yeah. and now I, I i think that you're you're right you're you might be onto something that the idea of standing in and taking the necessary hits you you cannot you can't stop those sort of hits for a whole season. Okay. You can't even stop them for a whole game. It's going to happen. Maybe, maybe the prospect of those hits is just too much for this. Yeah. He might be realizing why there's never been a 45 year old starting quarterback, the human body at that age. I hate to inform you, Denny. I mean, you're not that far away. from (laughs) uh, Cannot take that kind of punishment. Are you telling me I I can't get, I'm not going to be able to get drilled in the ribs by 300 pound men. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I know. I know you like to go down to the park and you just pay random strangers twenty dollars to spear you. Me. Just yeah. I just put my arm straight up in the air and they just come barreling heads first. Blast me right into the trash can. I yeah, I know it's metal. <laughs> I mean Zero. if that happened to me once, I just want everyone to know I would be dead. And that you loved them. And that <laughs> you right. will be happier wherever you're going, <laughs> Denny. Uh we're going to the next topic. Uh <laughs> so, um Denny, another quarterback who could at least be moving on from his current team is Lamar Jackson. We're going on like so little information here, but to me, that's probably part of the point. Like the sides are at such loggerheads, like it's such a contract impasse, that stuff that usually happens during like off season contract negotiations, like we're not talking or we're not even like being in the same room with each other. Uh, we're happening during the season. Uh, just see we, you can read whatever you want until Lamar not being at the playoff game. We talked about that on the recap pod too, where it's actually pretty standard for injured players not to travel uh, with their team, but it's it's not universal though. And Lamar Jackson has traveled plenty of times in the past when he's been injured. So just kind of strange. Like, yeah. what, what are the odds you think he's back with the Baltimore Ravens in 2023? Um, I think the odds are fine, but not great. Um, I, I will say that the enormous Ravens tattoo across his chest is something <laughs> that makes me think that he will be back. That can be um, adjusted. Right. I mean, I guess, yeah, with my That can be turned out. into a little, uh, trying to think of the most absurd mascot. I was going to say the Cleveland Brown guy, but they already have a quarterback signed for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, but it, that tattoo can be adjusted. All right. Well, if if that's the case, then I I think that there's a decent chance that Lamar will explore his options. Um, I think if he were committed uh, to what they what the team had offered, it, I mean, it, what I'm saying is, uh, if if he was okay with the t- what the team had offered, he would have already taken this deal. He didn't. Uh, the Ravens owner has said that uh, fully guaranteed contracts are ridiculous. 
Uh, he was the first one to come out against Deshaun Watson's deal with the Browns. I think all, all of this says that, that, that there will be some possibility that, that Lamar will end up somewhere else. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the Giants. I think we're looking at a tag and trade scenario because as the boys pointed out to me Sunday night, it was really late at night. And I was like, yeah, maybe let's let him go. Uh, that, that's literally like not an option. They will, no. <laughs> they will franchise tag him. And, but it was almost midnight, all right, um, when I said that. Right, but, uh, yeah, that's, that sounds I think awesome. it'd be – for some reason, I get the feeling he's going to be a Carolina Panther. Mm. Uh, that guy has been so thirsty, David Tepper, yes. for a franchise quarterback. He seems to be just shockingly impatient. He um, is. He seems to always be looking for miracle cures, and not that Lamar Jackson – Lamar Jackson would, would be somewhat keen to a miracle cure. And, uh, I get the feeling Lamar Jackson's going to be a Carolina Panther. Yeah, yeah you know – uh, I, and th- this this would be uh, a huge blow for the Ravens organization beyond just losing Lamar Jackson because they have fashioned their entire team around having Lamar Jackson as their their quarterback. They've invested basically nothing in wide receiver. Okay, besides I know they they drafted Rashad Bateman, so I, I understand that. But they uh, why do you think that Lamar's backups are mobile? Like it's because that offense is designed to do to operate one way and not any other way. They would have to just completely rip out that offense by the roots and start again. It would be a huge uh, organizational shift if they lost Lamar. It, it makes you wonder if they could do it. Yeah. I just, I mean, it's not the first time the contract negotiations have gotten very nasty. And I say that and it hasn't, they haven't gotten like publicly nasty. I mean, still, we're still just kind of inferring there. And we still, I mean, we don't know. For all we know, Lamar Jackson genuinely could not have played in this wild card round. But what well, he probably could have by the letter of the law, but he was doing what he needed to do, which oh. was if he's not 100% healthy, he Look, can't. Ri- Ro- it would make zero sense for him. Robert Griffin the third, his yeah, post yeah. on Twitter was was right on. It I, was 100% I, right. I advocate, yeah. you know, uh, he advocated for Lamar Jackson to to be careful, uh, to watch out for himself. Um, and if if folks are me- old enough to remember what RG three RG three went out with a busted knee, Come on, and man. DC he, Metroplex area teams they're always looking out for the quarterback's health, right? Right. Yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, and his his career basically ended because of that. Um, I know it's I know he became then like a meme, like it was like a joke, RG three, whatever. But we forget that RG three was a a sensation, a revelation in his rookie season, and had a, a very bright future. Uh, ahead of him yeah the, man what talk about an all-time what if i mean maybe maybe his size was was such that he was always gonna suffer yeah, a major maybe. injury at some point and just talk about a guy who had no regard for their body uh, mm-hmm. robert griffin the third but that is true in not joking fashion the zoomers will never know how good robert hey, griffin the third was that washington offense was just like I, I don't know, like revolutionary. It was. I, it was. I, 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 it was I, it, there had not been nothing like it in modern football up to that point in time. It was. It's so exciting. It was a very exciting uh, time. And so he. So yeah. I mean, he makes the point on Twitter. Hey, Lamar has many years, good years ahead of him. He's not going to sacrifice it so they can beat the Bengals tonight. Yeah, just no. not going to do it. No, because too, this team was not a super. It was not a super. No, this team, team even with Lamar, who who are they? They're they're fine. They might beat the Bengals. They're not going to win next next. They did almost beat the Bengals, man. What were the Bengals doing? Oh, they, <laughs> they were did. playing scared. They were they scared. Out of their minds. They were scared. They did almost beat the Bengals. We're not playing scared, but we still do. We need a break. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Just a reminder: if you don't have the NBC Sports Predictor app, go download it now. The contests are free and easy to play, and you have a shot to win thousands this weekend by predicting what will happen in college basketball, in the Premier League, and the Divisional Round. That includes a shot at $100,000 by guessing the outcome between the Jaguars and Chiefs. You want to know why it's the Jaguars and Chiefs, Denny? Why is that? 4.30 p.m. Eastern Saturday on NBC and Peacock. Mm. Jags, Chiefs. Highest total of the weekend, currently at 53. 53. Yeah, I know. It's the highest I've seen for a playoff game in quite a while. I'm, I'm interested in the under. There. Producer Adam says it's moved up from 52 earlier today. Don't, don't hold on. I just realized don't ever say the words the under on this podcast. We don't talk about the under. What? Well, well, yeah. <laughs> it's a, we're the fantasy. We're fantasy boys. It's got only the over ever. I'm just saying that the, the Jags are going to try to establish it. 
They're going to try to keep the ball away from Patrick Mahomes, all that nonsense. You know. I, I never want to hear the words of the under again, except for maybe <laughs> Thursday when we break down the games in depth with Patrick Crane and Kyle Dvorak. Uh, <laughs> Denny, uh, I, I, this segue makes no sense. It was originally supposed to come after Tom Brady. <laughs> but I was like, Speaking of how good or bad something really is, that Brandon Staley, Denny, he was the thinking man's football world's dream but that kind of led to a tortured relationship with him. We wanted him to be good because he said the word analytics three times. <laughs> he appeared to actually read some of the websites occasionally. But then when that didn't quite pan out, we turned on him very, very, very quickly, uh, very hard. Uh, we just condemned the man uh, any chance we get. Is this actually justified? Or like there's just too many narratives piled on top of each other with Brandon Staley. Like with, without – trying to like make memes or like try to be funny can we is like brandon staley a good coach or not he's a good i think he's a good defensive coach um and well, for and, one half against the jaguars and and I, I i do think that um i mean you know the the, the chargers are so snake bitten with injuries and, and derwin james is available for like three games a year and joey bosa plays eight eight plays a game uh it's it's so it's hard to say like how good they could be if they were if they were finally healthy but uh i think he had two things going for him or he has two things he's going to keep his job it looks like of course the chargers fired uh joe lombardi there we will talk about in a second or we'll we'll have yeah during but, this conversation but yeah so i think i think brandon staley is is a good defensive coach who needs to hand over the reins completely to someone else on offense and i think that he's a good decision maker now i will I will say also that he makes the good good decisions on fourth downs, but he but the team never called plays that can work. No, you I know, know? and I and know. so there, it's a two step process. We've talked about it. It's two step. You decide to go for it on fourth and three at the fifty. Yes, that's that's good. Okay, you've done well so far. You're almost there. You need to pass the ball. That's the second. That's the second step. And you don't just run Austin Eckler off left guard and lose three yards. That that that's the problem. And if they can solve that part, I think that they can be a super aggressive team with a good defensive minded coach and someone on offense who can get the most out of Justin Herbert. Yeah, it seems like someone who like understood like a macro concept and then never ever dug into the micro details. Like, well, play actually has to work. That's, yes, that's weird. Yes, um, and, and, and isn't that strange though for? For a guy who who was so committed, at least before he had the analytics beaten out of him this year, yeah. um, uh, he was so committed to doing the thing that no one else would do, but wouldn't execute it properly. It just no. doesn't make any sense. And like the third down calls never seem like they bore any relationship to the fourth down call. Like if you're you want to be like a true, we're going for it on fourth down team. You have to approach it like holistically. Like you don't treat fourth down like some walled off garden. Like, well, it's fourth down. Let's just do something totally different now. Right. Or like it has to be like in relationship, in concert with the previous play calling. You know, part of being a – so I actually do think he totally entrusted someone else with the offense, which maybe was part of where the disconnect was because like Joe Lombardi's offense you know, is just so conservative, so narrow, so like horizontal. And like where maybe it's a kind of offense that doesn't work on fourth downs too. Like that might have been part of the problem was just like – not an offense design, not an offense that's gonna like be taking big risks, you know. And so part of being a good leader is like knowing who to entrust the stuff that you can't run to. So I guess that has been a good first step, firing Joe Lombardi. And not to pile on a guy getting fired, but like he had to be fired. But it just this oh, was yeah. not yeah. Wait, I talked about this too in the other podcast. So sorry if I'm repeating myself a little bit, but I mean the reason Justin Herbert, the only reason Justin Herbert was a controversial prospect coming out of Oregon. It seems like a million years ago that we were like debating Justin Herbert, but he was so conservative in the Pac-12. He did not throw deep. When he did, he seemed to lack confidence deep. And so then when he came in as a rookie and was just amazing at that and blew everyone's mind, and now Joe Lombardi has just spent the past two years like forgetting that player existed. Yeah. And it has what short-circuited this team. It's what short-circuited this offense. So I, mean, I guess is, is firing Joe Lombardi – enough is that really as simple as it is how to fix the bolts offense and salvaging justin herbert's potential or and like just saying throw down field more or are there other bigger issues here Daniel? just to provide some context to what you're saying about about the the lack of downfield throwing for a guy who probably has 
the strongest arm in the entire NFL outside of maybe Josh Allen. Um, he was, uh, since the start of 2021, Justin Herbert was 31st in air yards per attempt. Uh, that's just inexcusable. That's over two years. Man, um, just... Perhaps that, that has something to do with Herbert's, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, dedication, commitment to just checking down, throwing the safe ball. I think it also has to do with the fact that the Chargers have nobody who can get open. They, yeah, it's they, just the personnel too. I mean, like Keenan Allen is he's like, a possession uh, receiver. Yeah. You know, he, and and he's he's good at what he does, but he's he's not a burner. He's not someone who can get the open downfield. I've never seen Keenan Allen even run downfield. No, <laughs> no, that's, you have never seen. Oh, wow, Keenan Allen's twenty yards down the field. That's I've never I've never seen him run more than seven yards off the line of scrimmage. Keenan Allen will never run twenty yards. <laughs> no, down he the field. won't. And and Mike Williams, I know he is a deep threat, and that's because he's really good at those 50-50 balls. But they are fifty fifty balls. Because he's never open. Okay. <laughs> Come on, man. And no, I mean, he's Devontae Parker. I mean, both <laughs> of those guys, they're big, tall guys, hyper athletic, but not fast. Okay. Like not fast. So they, they have to get some speed in this offense, whether it's through the draft, free agency, they have to have someone who, who I'm trying, I'm, I'm blanking here. Who was the deep threat who would just get one target? Well, we talked yard. about this a little on Sunday. It was okay. Jalen Guyton. Guyton. Well, that's Guyton. like another indictment. Your and whole offense just can't fall apart because, like, the situational deep threat gets hurt. It's like Mike Williams getting hurt. Of course, that's going to remove some of your downfield element. But, like, just to have Mike Williams and Jalen Guyton getting hurt is meaning you don't have a downfield passing attack. You have to have some way to adjust, like, some way to keep that element in your offense. I mean, their offense was just pathetic. It was just – so, especially coupled with the lack of a running game, they were as one dimensional. The only, it's a miracle they made the playoffs at all. And the yeah. only reason they made the playoffs is because Justin Herbert is so good. And even when you put him in this one dimensional box, he still creates enough offense. But like, I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen a more one dimensional offense with a good quarterback. Right. I saw from Justin Herbert and the Chargers this year. Well, what I'm, what I'm asking the Chargers to do, and I know the Chargers brass is listening uh got to sign dj chark this offseason oh man that would be amazing you got to do it speaking to the average depth of target thing by the way there were two quarterbacks this year who averaged fewer air yards per attempt than justin herbert matt ryan and the man you've decreed unstoppable daniel jones yeah. <laughs> um, the only two quarterbacks in the entire league who averaged fewer air yards i mean that's just when you have justin herbert sorry i mean there are greater factors to play, like injuries, like we just discussed. That's just plainly inexcusable. Like, just I, plainly I'm, I'm inexcusable. To... I know they have protection issues too. A so it's hard for stuff to develop. That is plainly inexcusable. I, I, I'm I'm actually shocked that the Chargers like don't have someone on the practice squad who could no. just come in. You know, could could they could activate this guy and he could run five routes a game. You know, and all of them are just absolutely nine routes just down the sideline. Just go. Right. They don't there's nobody in the organization who can run who can do that. Like Mike Williams is your only call or or Guyton. That's it. That that, that to me, that's a problem. So it, it is it's very damning. So too, we are also talking about just maybe Tom Telesco finally needs to go. Because how many years in a row can the Chargers roster supposedly look good and then just very easily fall apart? I know. Like Injuries are always partly to blame, but guess who else deals with injuries? Every single team but in the NFL. The, the Chargers are really bad at managing injuries. I will say, like oh, they're, they're they're constantly rushing guys back. You know, they are. They, they, they actually always have been. Yeah. The, the, the the Week 18 debacle with Mike Williams and Joey Bosa getting dinged up like that. That's that's just stuff you you don't see from other teams. I I know that, like there, there, there's a luck factor with injuries. I and no that. other team has ever punctured their quarterback's lung. With but yeah, but stop injection. hurting your players. Like just let them heal up. You know, uh, that the Chargers it starts from the top. They have one of the worst ownership groups in American sports. Oh. My worst, I mean poorest. Which you know maybe they actually are like nice good people, but they are quite poor by NFL owner standards. And boy, do they run the team like it. Um, so, I didn't know that. Jeez. Yeah, the Span the Spanos family, they're famously like they have hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sure, but amongst NFL owners, that's you know, like Jerry Jones, like this looks stares at yeah. the at the marble. Like when he walks by, he can't even look at him. His presence <laughs> disgusts him. And he's like, dude, I have three hundred million dollars. Like I'm I'm your peer. And Jerry Jones just yeah. he just walks out of the room. 
uh, Jerry Jones knows 900 people with $300 million. He does. <laughs> that he does, Denny. I know 900 nanoseconds <laughs> that we'll be right back after. Download the Roto World app to see breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players in your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It is available in your app store today. Denny, whereas the analytics world is out on Brandon Staley, at least for now, we remain in, I include myself in this, the analytics world, we remain in on Mike McDaniel. It is despite a pretty rough end of the season, but then a valiant playoff effort with the number three quarterback. Uh, How do we assess what we saw in year one from the latest Shanahan family disciple du jour? I, I mean, overall, I think it went as well as as it could have, as far as scheme goes, as far as like really like trying to find the edges, uh, uh, the, the edges in how to exploit defenses. I know we talked a lot about, and 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 you know, folks who who watch the film obviously talk a lot about the Dolphins hammering the middle of the field, which is uh, the best way and the most efficient way to move the ball. Uh, yeah. It, and it happened to gel nicely with what Tua does well, which is to just check Tua down. Tua will never throw outside the numbers. Right. And so you you ask the, the second that team started to adjust and Tua had to throw it to the outside or or take off running, things kind of fell apart. So I do think that there, there was uh, uh, something of a lack of adjustment there late in the season. I, I don't know. I have no suggestions for how you compensate for, for teams taking away how you were destroying them early in the season with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle in the middle of the field, uh, but there there has to be some some sort of way that you can compensate for that. I don't know if it requires a quarterback with a stronger arm. I don't know if it if it means running the ball more. But Mike McDaniel, I think first and foremost, showed that he's willing to do what it takes to move the ball and to score points, and we like that. I think that what it requires is a better offensive line. I think that was a big part yeah. of it. Yes. They were on like their third string left. They were like signing people off the street, like not even an exaggeration. And like nothing will develop down the field or along the sidelines because you won't have enough time if your offensive line is just getting your quarterbacks destroyed. And yeah, there was a little lack of adjusting, but for a rookie coach, he was just dealing with so many variables. And like even the number two quarterback like can't stay healthy. You know, like the offensive line again, it's just like a fallout zone with the injury. Right. I mean, for the play, I mean, Raheem Moster gets hurt. So like there goes like the most obvious backup plan. They couldn't even like commit to the run. And as much as we love Mike McDaniel's passing game, I mean, he is a Shanahan disciple. We know there's some a pretty great running game scheme in there, probably that they could have pivoted to. But like injuries just kind of prevent prevented a lot yeah. of that. And I mean, we saw him go toe to toe three times with the Bills, the team they're going to have to beat, the team they're going to have to dethrone in the AFC East and uh, Mike Medina, he never did anything like panicky to me or anything. He never like, there was never a point in a game. Like, so with Brandon Staley, you would just be like, like, why, mm-hmm. why mm-hmm. was that what you did? And <laughs> Mike McDaniel, I but even when things were going poorly, like I never like, why did Mike McDaniel do that? You know? Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I, I think I, he's the real deal. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I do too. I hope the dolphins have patience with him, you know, because we see so often like superstar young coaches come in, have some success, struggle a bit. And when they are failing uh, in non-traditional ways, then ownership kind of gets a little impatient with that and says, Hey, like I'm, I look like a fool here. If you're going to fail, you got to do it traditionally. Like we got to start punting on fourth and inches, Mike. If they, if they, if they, if the dolphins stand behind him and let him do his thing, I think he can, be successful. I wanted to point out in the in the wild card game, okay, with Skylar Thompson starting for the Dolphins, uh, they were actually over their expected pass rate on first down by a significant margin. That's good. That tells you, I think that tells you that Mike McDaniel does everything he can to put his quarterback in as good a position as possible. And what I mean by that, and Pat Corain has talked a lot about this in his walkthrough column, is on first down is when teams cannot, defenses cannot pin their ears back and go after the quarterback, okay, because of the threat of of the pass or the run. So putting your quarterback in a good position means passing a lot on first down. That's what Mike McDaniel did all season, and he didn't stop it with with Skylar Thompson. You talk about guys who do things unconventionally, and then when it fails, they look really bad, and then they pay for it. 
Um, Mark Tressman died for our sins there, Denny. Um, oh, he Zoomers did. will not remember. Look up his Wikipedia. He, he came from Canada. He is American, God, I, though. I, I loved Tressman. We did, too. But then he he didn't seem to be bad. <laughs> but uh, two, the only thing, too, with the Dolphins being patient, this is – Stephen Ross is a horrible owner. Like, horrible, horrible owner. Yeah. And very, yeah. very impatient. Um. So hopefully Stephen Ross stays because they finally they do have a coach. They had a coach worth building around of Brian Flores, and they pulled the plug on that. I mean, Brian Flores's approach to offense uh, was a little lacking. Yeah, where yeah. he played like every game, the final score had to be seventeen to fourteen, no matter which team won. Um, but he was, I think he's like a defensive mastermind, and they still fired him. I, I think Mike McDaniel has offensive mastermind in his range of outcomes. And they've got to stick with them. They absolutely got to stick with them for at least two more years. Don't don't burn yourself out, Mike. If you're listening, don't don't pull a Sean McVay and threaten to retire every single game. No, <laughs> Sean McVay. Yeah, I, Sean McVay. Yeah, just talk about someone to just go to Thailand, but only go for two weeks, and then you're yeah. fine. I fine. mean, he can't. Does he know he can go on vacation? No, <laughs> no, no. He just was memorizing every play from the season that just happened instead of going to Thailand for two weeks. Men will literally memorize every single play from the entire 22 season rather than going to Thailand. Right. I'm Sean McVay is watching a uh, middle school film of Baker Mayfield, right? Now. <laughs> uh, he's going on vacation. Yeah, Sean, just go on one little vacation. Just uh, to end the show here, I, I, I do mean this is a serious question. It's like Sean Payton, like apparently the trade conversation they want is a mid to late first round pick. What would you again? Not asking it for like a meme answer. Yeah. What would you actually trade for Sean Payton if you were an NFL general manager? What would you think would be worth it? I mean, I, I think I think uh, a first round pick. You do sense. think a first round pick? Yeah, yeah. I are you are you not on board there? Well, I'm not. I would maybe be on board depending on like the problem is some of the teams like they really need these for like the Denver Broncos. <laughs> can't trade another first round pick. They already don't have one this year. So they can't, can they really trade their second round pick this year? Like, I, I feel like the Broncos are in a situation where they just have to pass on the situation because they don't have the assets to give. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, man. There's like very few coaches I would trade a first round pick for. I would trade one for Bill Belichick. I would trade one. I hate to say it for Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, Sean Payton, he was getting a little stagnant near the end. I mean, he's in his 60s. You would have to wonder how committed he is at this point. I think I would trade like a third round pick for Sean Payton. I'll give you a day two pick. I don't know, think I'm giving up a first round pick for Sean Payton. Sean Payton, uh, as an offensive coordinator and a head coach in the NFL, had a top 10 scoring offense in 12 of 15 seasons he also had drew Brees, though 12 12 i'm sorry 12 of 18 12 of 18 no but yeah and and it was all obviously was all with the um with the saints he was also the offensive coordinator of the giants in in the early 2000s but but i i know i know he had drew Brees. but when i when i think of the denver talk i i I think it makes sense he would be a great fit there there's no it makes sense in that um he took a, a guy with with very limited physical skills and a short guy who did not have a rocket arm. You're and describing you're describing Drew Brees like he's a mailman. <laughs> like, I mean, but he, but I mean, he was you know there there he, was he, there he was, was serious questions about his physical about about you know his, his physical prowess as a, as a quarterback. He's a short guy who couldn't throw it far, and he, he turned him into a machine. Uh, now. Russell Wilson has his physical limitations. He he does, and I think that they, he, he, Sean Payton would be good for him. It would um and and would would give him the kind of throws that he can't screw up too badly. Which when when you give Russell Wilson the kind of throws that he can screw up, we saw that happen in Seattle in twenty twenty when they when things uh, fell to pieces, and we saw that all this year this year when when they uh you know let him cook whatever that meant. Sean Payton. I totally agree on the fit with Russell Wilson front because he's had success with basically like an identical style quarterback, as you point out. And also, he's one of the few coaches that can pull rank on Russell Wilson. And they really need a coach who can pull rank on yes. Russell Wilson, as we've seen that like when Russell Wilson is the Nathaniel Hackett, like it's just going to be the rush show. And they have to have a coach who's more powerful than the quarterback. There are very, very few of those around. Sean Payton would be one of them. But um, a team. 
that just earned a top five pick and doesn't even have that top five pick. Can they really trade like right. next year's first rounder or like even this year's second rounder? I don't know. No, I mean, the Broncos are down pretty bad no matter what happens, even if they get Sean Payton. I, I, and it's it's not a... It's it's not the best uh, landing spot for him. I mean, the most appealing, I should say. But you have a really good defense, both pass and run defense. You have a potentially all-world running back in Javante Williams if he gets back from that knee injury. You have some good pass catchers. I I think there, there's there's enough to work with here. I think the good news for the Broncos, Sean Payton just turned 59. I said he was in his 60s. It seems like he doesn't want to wait around. Like like this is a really I mean. By definition, the opening coaching the open coaching gigs are usually unattractive for one reason or another. This is like a uniquely unattractive slate of openings because not only is it teams that are bad, but it's a lot of bad organizations. Um, the Broncos are always known as a good organization, but it's a totally new ownership group now. Um, but I mean, the, he's interviewing for real with the Texans. He's interviewing for real with the Panthers, two really shaky organizations right now. So I, I think he's committed to actually coaching in 2023 which is really good for the Broncos because the Broncos probably are the most attractive opening. Um, right. But I, yeah, think they, so. I don't know what the, I just don't know, man. Uh, uh, I don't think they don't have, they don't have the assets to give. No. Right. I mean, that, that is obviously the problem. I will say that if he goes to Denver, we will be quickly talking about Jimmy Graham's success in Sean Payton's offense. Oh my gosh. When, <laughs> when, when we discuss Greg Dulcich this off season. Oh my, that, that was too, I guess, does he really want to go to the division with Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert, by the way, there's a lot of moving parts here. Maybe that's why, maybe that's why he, maybe he really wants the Texans job. Like put me in the division mm. with no good organizations, please. Yeah, that, that's um, actually a really good point. <laughs> So we'll see what happens. We will not see what else happens on the show because nothing else will happen because it's over. Um, Denny, you're going to have your manifesto coming out again this week. Maybe maybe a little earlier? Is yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, the interns are working on it. We will we will have that up by uh, Thursday morning. Oh, hell yeah. Amazing article. You're just Denny does an amazing weekly preview during the playoffs. A lot, a lot of DFS sicko talk and not and non sicko talk actually, but a lot of sicko talk. A lot of sicko talk, but really, really good stuff. I will hopefully have something on the website. I don't know what it is though. I don't have any ideas yet. Denny always has ideas. Maybe you can text me one after the show. I'm an ideas man. I need an idea. Uh, but yeah, my idea for now is to end the show. So for Denny Carter, I'm Patrick Darty. Thank you for listening. We'll be back on Thursday with Patrick Crain and Kyle Dvorak. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotoworld, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.